Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's Sheep EID webinar. We're just waiting on a few to join and then we'll kick everything off. Okay, we might get started. Um, so thanks again for joining. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respect, respect to the Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which I am on today and extend that to elders past, present and emerging. The aim of today's webinar is to share with you what, why and how EID is being implemented when it must be done by, and what rebates are available. Our speakers today are Ash Wildrich, Industry Liaison Officer with DPI, and Nathan Scott from Achieve Ag. Ash is part of the New South Wales Sheep and Goat Traceability Team that was established earlier this year to help share information about the implementation of sheep and goat EID across New South Wales. Nathan, he's a leading Australian provider of advice in the practical use of electronic identification within stud and commercial sheep and cattle enterprises. Today, Ash is going to kick off the webinar and she'll be taking questions following her presentation. Nathan will then take over and of course, you can ask any questions of Nathan at the end. Please feel free to add any of your questions or comments to the question box, which is on your webinar control panel. There are handouts available in the panel as well. However, these will also be sent out with the recording following the webinar in the next day or so. So without any further delay, I'll hand you over to Ash. Thanks, Naomi, um, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for dialing in. Um, I do hope that uh, you pick up some good information from this presentation. Um, up on the screen at the moment, um, I've just got a QR code or a few um, don't scan the QR code, um, you can go straight to slido.com and enter hashtag Murray LLS. And that will just take you through so you can um, be, a bit, be a part of a bit more of an interactive presentation. I've got a couple of questions scattered through the presentation that will, that will help, I guess, find out where everyone's up to um, and um, help, I guess, shape some of the, the questions and the answers. Um, around sheep and goat EID and, and what it's going to look like for everyone and how we as, as New South Wales DPI as well as LLS can help you. Um, so I hope that you're all able to scan that and then as I go through the slides, it should pop up on your phone with the questions um, as we go through them and they should be hopefully fairly quick and simple to go through. Um, so I'll just go on to our next slide, which is the first slide of question and a fairly simple one to start us off with. And as you can see that the QR code is still on screen if you need to um, still access that. So for our first question, we have which of the following options best describes your involvement in the sheep and goat industry? So if you're a, a sheep producer, we've got a, an industry consultant that's popped in online. Uh, for goat, we've got goat producers, agents, um, maybe your processor or work in, in, a, in an abattoir or knackery. Um, we've also got option for sale yards or an EID manufacturer or merchandiser. And um, so far it looks like we've, we've got a couple of consultants um, and sheep producers online, which is great to see, and some agents, which is also fantastic because um, Agents will be a very key source of information for a lot of producers. Um, so that's really awesome. So thanks everyone for participating in that first one. Um, no goat producers at this stage, but that's all right. Uh, so I'll, I'll move us along onto the start of 
the presentation. So I first want to dive into a little bit of the why uh, Australia is going into EID and why we're doing it now. Uh, so biosecurity uh, is very important to Australia and our geographic isolation really helps with that. Um, but with the increasing ease of international travel, um, as well as unfortunately foot and mouth disease in particular, getting so close to Australian shores, just um, over in Indonesia, it is showing that biosecurity threats are ever increasing. And the way EID can help with that is it improves our traceability of livestock that we have so that should a biosecurity um, incursion happen, we are able to trace our livestock much faster and much more accurately so that in a response, um, we can, I guess, understand the response and take control of it much quicker than we would have been able to with a visual tag system. And this all plays into market access where um, if certain um, biosecurity events happen, we can lose our access to international markets immediately. Um, and for a country that exports a very significant portion of our wool and our sheep and goat meat, um, this would be very devastating. Uh, and so traceability uh, with the EIDs just gives us that little bit of an edge so that we can um, get on top of the incident quicker and we can return to market access quicker. And it also um, may help us access certain premium markets by showing lifetime traceability of our livestock. Uh, I'll just cover a little bit about what an EID looks like and how it's a little bit different to the visual tags. So um, in a visual tag, it will normally require you have your pick printed on it. Whereas with an electronic tag, this changes to an NLIS ID number. So that NLIS ID includes your PIC, but it also includes some extra um, coding associated with it. So it has a, a manufacturer's code. It has a device type. So it indicates if it's a tag for a sheep or a tag for a goat, and also breeder or post breeder tag. Um, there's also a, number, uh, a letter to indicate what year the tag is from and then a serial number. And this NLIS ID number links up directly with an RFID number, both of which are unique to every individual animal. And the RFID number is the number that you pick up by scanning the tag. Um, the number is contained within a microchip and can be picked up from a scanner from about 20 to 100 centimeter read range, depending on what type of scanner you have. Um, but if you don't have a scanner, you can record the NLIS ID number. And as it's unique and linked directly to the RFID number, um, it essentially serves as the same thing. Um, and as with your current visual tags, most electronic tags, you can also have a visual identifier printed on them as an option, be that um, a property name, a stud name, or a number, That's that should still be available with most types. Um, so we've got our next Slido question here. So get your phones back out. Um, quick, simple one on this one is, do you currently use um, EIDs in your sheep and goats? Mixed bag so far. We, um, we are finding slowly that, that more and more people have started to use EIDs. Um, so it, it's, it's a very, it's a constantly changing number. Um, it is currently not mandatory. So for those of you that aren't currently using it, that's completely okay. Um, and we'll dive in shortly into a bit more information about when it does become mandatory. Um, and for those that are already using it, We'll also touch briefly on some of the benefits that can be obtained through using EIDs, which um, I'll jump into first. So as I mentioned before, the benefits at, a, at, an, at an Australia national level is around that biosecurity and market access. But on farm, there are also different benefits that you can achieve um, if you want to full, fully utilise EID. Um, just keep in mind, this is all optional. Uh, so you can, so EIDs can help reduce some manual handling of your sheep. 
Um, and this can be done through using certain equipment to automate data recording. So you can have readers that will automatically scan your sheep when you're, um, you know, when you're weighing or when you're drenching or doing other husbandry practices. Um, and then this information can then be recorded at the individual animal level. So you can keep records for individual animals over their lifetime on your property. And then this information in turn can then be used to make database decisions. So it can be used to identify um, your fastest growing lambs that you might want to retain for breeding. It might also identify which ewes have been empty two years in a row that you want to then send for culling um, and a, a very wide array of other things. Um, so into our next poll, so get your phones back out. Um, so before I go into any of the details, I'd be interested to know is um, what do you currently understand about what you need to do to implement sheep and goat on your property? So, you know, are you, you know, you're all over it, you know exactly what you need to be doing? Um, or are you still not really sure about what is required on your property to implement sheep and goat EID? Um, are you maybe, you're, you're aware that it's coming and that you need to do it, but perhaps you don't have all the information and you're still looking for a bit more? Um, or, may, or, you know, if you're unsure about where you're at at this stage. And, um, you know, for those of you that might be consultants um, or agents, uh, this might not be, if you don't have your own livestock, it might not be completely relevant for you, but um, please do apply it in terms of what you understand that other people might need to do. Um, but I can see that mostly we've we've got um, people with at least some understanding of where it's, um, what the implementation requirements are for sheep and goat EID at the moment. So I'll just move on to our next slide. Um, so a little bit about the tagging requirements. And we've got two sort of slogans here that, that give it a basic summary of, of what's changing. And for the first one is the tag changes, not the rules. So if you currently are using an Elias accredited visual tags, instead of using those, you'll then change them to an Elias electronic IDs. Um, and that is the minimum requirement and the only change that you really need to make. Uh, for those that do work in harvested rangeland goats, um, I'm not sure if we have any online, but for those that do, um, if you've, um, the previous or the current approved pathway where rangeland goats can be moved without tags will still remain once EID implementation comes through, provided that the goats meet um, the requirements of, of rangeland goat movements. Um, having a quick look at when this is all happening. So um, for processes, which are the first part, they will be required to start scanning any sheep or goats that have EID tags from the end of June next year. And then they'll be uploading those to the Analyze database. Then for producers, so from the 1st of January, 2025, EID tags need to be fitted to any sheep or goats that are born from this date before they leave their property of birth. Um, at the same time, sale yards and depots will also be scanning um, any animals that come with EID tags and uploading those for their analysed movements. And then again, for property to property movements of sheep or goats, any that have EIDs will also need to be scanned and uploaded to the analysed database. And the last step of the implementation happens on the 1st of January 2027. Um, and that's when all sheep and goats, regardless of how old they are, uh, of so sheep and farmed goats, regardless how old they are, will require an electronic um, tag before leaving any property. And again, um, rangeland goats will still have that, um, be will still be able to move without tags. Um, so just diving into that in a little bit more detail. So for, for primary producers, for livestock owners, for um, pet sheep owners. From the 1st of January, 2025, um, all lambs or kids born from this state must have an electronic device before they leave their property of birth. 
and then livestock owners again for property to property transfers will need to um, scan any EIDs or record the, the visual NLIS ID and report that into the NLIS database. Unless of course they um, are taken to or from a sale yard, in which case the sale yard will normally do that transfer for you. Um, and again, from the 1st of January, 2027, all sheep and goats, doesn't matter how old they are, they must have an EID device before they leave any property. Um, and that includes even if you just, you're taking your pet sheep to the vet, that's leaving your property and it does require an EID device. Um, and from this point, mob based movements and the visual and Elias tags will no longer um, be available to use. All right, with that little bit of um, information in mind, um, We've got uh, our next Slido poll, so get your phones up. And this one is, so what do you see as some barriers of implementing EID for sheep and goats on your property? Uh, so we've got the cost of tags and equipment as an option. Um, unsure how to use technology. Um, additional time taken to apply tags the risk of tags being lost, um, or maybe there's there's no barriers that you can currently see to applying. So at the moment, we've got um, a bit of a, a mixed uh, number of votes. So the cost of tags and equipment being the most voted barrier at the moment. Um, risk of tags being lost. So I, I will touch on that a little bit in the presentation. Um, and yeah, not sure how to use the technology. That's a very fair statement. It's um, very new for a lot of people. Um, and additional time to apply tags. So if, if applying um, additional tags, so if you already have visual tags and you have to apply an electronic tag, that, yep, that can take additional time. Otherwise, um, it's, it should take the same amount of time as applying your current visual tags. So I'll just move into the next slide. So I've got a couple of, um, I guess, quick facts here around EIDs for sheep and goat owners. So um, a, an individual animal can only have one Analyse accredited EID device. Um, and that's um, largely the, when scanning, um, you need to have that one number that one microchip registered to the one animal. Otherwise, if your scanner is trying to pick up two at the same time, that's a bit problematic. It is an offence to remove an Analyse EID device unless it isn't functioning. And any non-functioning or missing tags should be replaced um, with an Analyse credited either breeder or post-breeder device, depending um, on what your needs are there. Um, EIDs can only be used on the species that are registered to the device. So as I mentioned in that NLS ID code, it includes uh, a letter to indicate if it's for a sheep or a goat. So do make sure if you're buying sheep tags, you only put them in sheep. And for sheep and goats, the tags can be attached to the left or the right ear. Um, there are some things to I guess be aware of to make sure you have the best retention that you can. So incorrect application of any e tags can actually damage the microchip and cause it to be a non-reader. So do make sure that when you're applying the tags, you have the correct applicator for the type of tags you're using. Um, and you will need to make sure that you just allow room for the ear to grow if it's one of those um, fold over wraparound tags as opposed to a button tag. Um, if you're applying them during marking or weaning. Um, and then ensuring that you place the device in the right position is also good for attention. So make sure it's not um, right near the edge of the ear where it can easily get caught and ripped out. Um, and do, um, for best practice, make sure that you use an appropriate disinfectant um, for your tags between, uh, between animals. Um, I won't go into this too much because Nathan will cover this in his talk. Um, 
but there are some things to consider that if you do need any handheld readers or fixed panel readers or any other EID equipment. Um, just because EID is becoming mandatory, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to need this equipment. Um, so just keep that one in mind, um, particularly if you only buy and sell through sale yards as they do um, the scanning and the analyze transfers for you. Um, but I'll just leave that one there because Nathan will cover that. Um, oh, I think this poll might not be open, um, but I've, I've just sort of reused um, the poll of, you know, now I understand what I need to implement to sheep and goats EID on my property um, to see if, you know, if that information helped, but it looks like this poll, I'm not sure if it's open because it looks different to the other ones. Um, but I do hope that information that I just shared did provide a little bit more context and a little bit more understanding about when it's happening and why it's happening and what you'll need to do. So, I'll, oh, there it goes. Um, but I'll move on to the next one here. So um, I've got a few options here um, on a question is, what can we as DPI and LLS do to better help you um, to implement EID on your properties. Um, you know, be that through workshops, um, like on-farm workshops or webinars such as we're doing now, um, technology and equipment demonstration days. Um, you know, um, do you like podcasts and videos that you can listen to when you're in the tractor or driving about? Um, you know, following on social media when you have your downtime, having a scan through there and seeing things pop up. Uh, yeah, what what's going to work best for you, and what um, what can we do to best get this information out to make it as smooth a transition as possible into EID for sheep and goats. So so far with our votes, it looks like. Um, workshops and demonstrations, so the, the, the more hands-on face-to-face stuff is um, of most interest. So that's great to see and we'll definitely be doing more of that next year. Um, so I'll just, um, before I finish up, I'll just finish with a little bit of information about our current EID infrastructure rebate scheme. So this is currently open and available for sale yards, processors, agents and producers, um, as well as depots. And the rebate um, information or all the details about it is available on the RAA website, which there's a link on the page there. Um, this is included in a handout that's available um, either in the, the side panel of the um, meeting at the moment or will be emailed out to everyone tomorrow I believe. So no need to rush and write that down. Um, so for the producer rebate scheme it is to claim up to 50% of the cost of eligible items that have been purchased from the 15th of December 2022 and is paid on a first in best dress basis. Uh, there are two um, streams of the producer rebate. The first being for EID readers and software covering um, up to 50% of the cost to $4,000. And the second being um, for auto drafts and goat handling equipment. Um, and that's up to 11,250. Um, there are a few eligibility criteria for producers to claim for the rebate. Um, so you must be a sheep or a farmed goat primary producer. Uh, you need to be a sole trader, partnership, trust or private company. Uh, you'll need to have an ABN and a PIC and you'll also need to have some financial proof to show that you trade sheep and, or farmed goats. So the, the producer rebate scheme is currently open and is open until March next year. And um, if you're approved for the rebate, you'll have um, up to six months after the date of approval in which to submit your rebate claim. 
Um, so for this um, next Slido question, it's a, a, a sort of free text one. So um, you can submit as many individual words as you like, um, but in one word, how are you feeling about the introduction of sheep and goat electronic ID? So again, you're more than welcome to submit um, several different words, um, or maybe you've just got one one word that that sums it all up. Um, positive. That's a a great one to start off with. Oh, and optimistic. Seems like we've got a at least at the at the start we've got a good positive audience. So you're aware of um, what's going to happen and hopefully the benefits of it. Right, I'm not sure if um, anyone else is thinking of any other words that you'd like to add into that one. All right, well, I might move on just for the sake of time. Um, and similarly, uh, for the last one, we've got, uh, what is your key takeaway from this webinar about sheep and goat EID. Are there any key things that you've learnt? Um, any information that's particularly useful to you? Um, perhaps something was missing and you're still a little unsure about something? Traceability, yep, traceability is um, a very important part of EID. Um, oh, and, and thank you. I do hope it has been informative, um, but we will have a bit of time for additional questions. Um, so I'll just move on. So just to finish up my presentation, um, so uh, on our website, which is um, about to be updated with information, we have stacks of information and we'll have even more information about when it's happening, why it's happening, where you can get help from, where you can find more information, um, links to how to do analyse transfers um, in the new visual assist, uh, in the new electronic um, identification system. The QR code on screen is to our EID newsletter. Um, it is, uh, it's released about every two to three months, so you won't get spammed with lots of newsletters constantly. Um, and it's just, uh, I guess, an avenue for us to share key information and key links and key resources and um, you know, links to any rebates or funding and things like that will all be shared through that newsletter. And you're also more than welcome to contact us at any time through the sheepgoat EID at dpi.newsouthwales.gov.au um, email address. Uh, we're happy to take requests to come out and host events or deliver presentations. Um, perhaps you've got a, a field day or something else in your area that you'd really like us to attend. Um, or you might just have some other general questions or want to chat to us on the phone. So please contact us and we're more than happy to help with that. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen. Um, and open it up, Naomi, for any questions. Thanks, Ash. We have one question from Eddie. He's asked, do you need to report anywhere when you replace an EID tag? Um, so if, if you know what tag um, the animal had before, that so you know what the tag number was, then you can link up the new tag in the NLIS database to that one. Otherwise, if you're, if you're not sure what tag was missing, then, um, then it's just putting in a new tag and, and um, that's, yeah, that's more or less it. Um, well, thanks for that. I'll um, turn off my camera and I'll um, be available to answer any other questions, I guess, after Nathan's talk. Perfect. Thanks, Ash. We'll now hand over to Nathan. Just pop him on. Okay, Nathan, over to you. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, thanks Naomi and Ash. Um, so my task today is to talk about what we actually need from an EID point of view. And I thought I'd just actually started off by talking about what EID is in the first place. Um, and the, the first part of that is to understand, as Ash mentioned there before, it's RFID technology. Um, is it new technology? The answer is no, it's not. Uh, the first EID tags or RFID tags were released in 1992. So um, it's not a brand new technology, although it has evolved a bit. Uh, and so that often leads people to ask questions about, well, is it is it too old, the technology? But actually, it is the same technology that we're using every day in our lives with our tap and go in our credit cards. Um, every time someone walks out of the shop with one of those tags still on the clothes and the, and the, the sensor beeps, um, every time you check into a hotel room, it's all RFID technology. And the reason it's used is because it's so reliable. So it's an incredibly reliable source of, of technology for, um, for a whole range of tasks. So the big thing I want everyone to think about, whether you're a, uh, particularly for the producers, because that's, I suppose, where this first part of my presentation is, is targeted, is why would we want to use it on farm? So there's obviously the legislative requirements. Um, one of those key ones being that the receiver of livestock is the person responsible for, for actually recording that transaction on the NIS database. So if you're trading or you're buying through Auctions Plus a lot, then you are going to have a requirement to be able to read tags to be able to do those transfers. Now, you might be able to get your agent to do those for you. Um, there's plenty of agents that are here in Victoria that, that are equipped to be able to do that for their clients already. Um, and in New South Wales, we'll see that same thing happen. But for lots of people, they will want to be able to do that transaction themselves as well. So there is, there's obviously those legislative requirements. But I want you to think, for, for those that are looking for the on-farm benefits, to actually think about why we would use it in the first place. What are we trying to achieve? And that's, I suppose, the big question is, is we should always be starting with why. What is it that we're actually trying to achieve in the first place? And um, so before we get into the actual different pieces of equipment and technology, I just want to set the scene a little bit with you around what we might want to achieve. The first part of that is to actually understand. So Ash mentioned it briefly before, but we know in any population we get what we call population dynamics. So that is we get variation in performance. We've got poor performers, average performers and superior performers and sheep are no different. So whether that is in fleece weight or micron or growth rates or fertility, we know within each of these various traits, we've got this sort of bell shaped curve or this population dynamics. and Historically, what we've done is we've managed them in a, in a mob-based system. And essentially what happens within our mob-based system is we know we've got that variation in each of our age groups. So we will try and find those poor performers, the ones that are really obvious, um, and kick them out. But essentially we end up with that same sort of variation. And then we end up kicking out a whole age group at the end once they reach a certain age, um, ultimately because we need to be able to bring in better genetics. So it gives us a chance to actually see that we've, we've got this variation across all of the different age groups. If we stop and think about what it might look like if we actually were able to track the performance of every individual rather than just looking at averages, we would be able to identify or we can identify those poor performers as early as we possibly can and kick them out. So it depends on what trait it is as to how early, um, but for things like wool traits, we can do that after their first main shearing. So before they have their, before their first um, lambing. And so all that means is if we've identified those poor performers, we can kick them out and the flock that we're left with is better than what we started with. We've now made up of, of what were the average and superior performers. And we've also got this, this other age group, and this is something that we're seeing with clients at the moment, with old sheep not being worth terribly much, young sheep being worth a bit more, um, some of them are making the most of the fact that some of their old ewes, their six-year-old ewes, are some of the best performers on the whole farm. Um, we just don't, without individual management, without being able to track their performance, we just don't necessarily know who they are. But there's a lot of animals that we actually kick out just because they've had a birthday. And the reality is we could make the most of them. Now, there is obviously the caveat on that, that uh, that with, with every older age group that we keep, there is a higher risk of things like hypercalcemia and, and those sorts of things. So we need to take that into account. But the reality is some of those old ewes are still some of the best genetics we've got on the whole farm, if we know who they are. 
So that's the, that's sort of the the concept between or the difference between traditional mob based where we've got that constant variation through all of our age groups versus being able to find those passengers in the system earlier and kick them out. And so that's the the um, the whole basis of individual animal management. We basically grab that bell shaped curve that I talked about, and if we take off a slice off the bottom, if we take those poor performers out, all we do is change the shape of that bell shaped curve. And so we can actually just continually take a slice off the bottom. Now, one of the reasons I think that's really important is nationally our, our sheep flock has moved much more to a breeder-based system. And so that means that we, um, we don't tend to have um, the same outlets that we would have. This whole idea of being able to just take a slice of the poor performers off is where we can make some generational gains. That's, we, we'll call it generational gains. I'll talk a bit more about genetic gains later on. But in terms of generational gains, every time we take a slice off the bottom of that bell-shaped curve, we kick out some poor performers or the poorer performers, um, it improves the animals that we're left with. And the main reason that I'm interested in that, as I said, with breeders now being making up the majority of your flock um, across the country, the old humble weather, unfortunately, has, uh, has disappeared in, in great numbers. And when I say unfortunately, the main reason is no one ever gets emotionally attached to weathers. So as soon as we hit dry times, pressure starts to come on, we think about adjusting our stocking rate. The humble weather was the one that we, we had no emotional attachment to and we would just kick them out. They would be the first to leave the farm. We wouldn't even hesitate. But the reality is as soon as it is a breeding ewe, we're much more likely to actually hold on to them. We're a bit hesitant to make that call. And I think the easiest way to change that flexibility within your system is to know who your poorer performers are and have sheep that we know that if we, we we're not going to be upset if we get rid of those, the, the sheep that we're left with will be better overall. And that's what we call that generational gain. Our, our flock that we're left with today is better than the flock that we had yesterday, simply because we've taken those poorer performers out. Now, the reality is if we keep doing that over time, and depending on um, which traits we're selecting on, we will make genetic gain as well. So heritability of different traits obviously varies. So some traits like fertility are low heritability, but other traits like wool traits are quite heritable. And so that means if we keep doing that, we keep kicking out poor performance, we will make genetic gain over time. And so that's why both generational gain and genetic gain are of interest to us. So that gives us sort of some basis around partly why we might be interested in, in EID on farm. The other reason is to stop the mistakes. And what I mean by this is to actually know if we are applying selection pressure on farm, um, how we can inform ourselves a bit better to make sure that we're not making mistakes. And this is just a simple example because some of what I'm presenting today can be presented as a whole day workshop. I'm just sort of pick the eyes out of it for you. But we should only be comparing comparable sheep. And what do I mean by that? It's, it's pretty simple, but a twin born Merino, if we use that as an example, it's likely to be smaller, it will cut you less wool and at a higher micron. So if it's standing in the race next to all of its single born mates, as we go down, if we don't know that that's a twin born animal, we are likely to cull that animal. Now, if we keep doing that year after year after year, we will be putting negative pressure on fertility because we're not breeding from any of our twins because they're, they're just not simply not staying in the flock. So we should only be comparing twin born animals with twin born animals and single born animals with single born animals. And that way, we can make a fair comparison. We can still take out the, the worst of each group, um, but we're not just kicking out all of our twins simply because we don't know that they were born as a twin. It's just one of the simple examples. There are others, but it's just one of the simple examples of, of how we can stop making the mistakes. I think it's something we've got to be more conscious of um, whenever we're culling something that has the potential to stay in our flock. Is, is it her fault or yours? Are we culling her because she doesn't look quite right, but ultimately that's because we either didn't feed her properly or we don't realise that she was born as a twin. Um, and, and when I say that, that didn't feed her properly, that happens a lot in mature ewes. Pressure comes on, we need to sell some breeding ewes. Often it'll be the lighter condition score ewe that gets kicked out, when the reality is she might have been the one that reared you twins and cut you a decent fleece, while you've got other ewes in there that look big and fat and shiny and great as they run at you down the, the drafting race. Um, and we keep the big fat shiny ones, the reality is they haven't done a hell of a lot for you. So actually being able to understand some of that, that variation in performance can be important so that we're making informed decisions 
uh, if we're kicking anything out of the flock. So ultimately, it brings us back to that question of why. There's heaps of variation within our flock, and you might want to try and get a piece of the pie there in terms of identifying some of that variation and, and trying to capitalise on it. So you might have seen um, on the on the right hand side in your panel for the the webinar, there's actually a document I've got there which I'll put up on the screen in a second. But it talks you through how you can set your own objective for your sheep operation. So the first thing we need to do is is set a smart objective. And this sometimes when someone says to you, oh, you need to write down a smart objective, it sounds like it's a bit of a um, something that someone in the office wants you to do. The reality is it's actually really important. If we just put down, and that could be that I want a merino, I want my merino flock to be cutting five and a half kilos of 18 and a half micron wool, um, marking 110% lambs, turning off um, a portion of lambs as terminals at, at 10 months of age, and I want to be achieving all of that by 2027. That's the sort of thing that is a smart objective. It's got things in there that we can measure. Um, it's got things in there that are time bound, but they are still quite specific and they are realistic. The reason we want to try and actually pin down where you want to get to and by what date is then when we swing into this planning tool, it actually allows us to start breaking that down. What are the things that we could measure that are going to make a difference to us? And then based on that, is EID or what role can EID play in that? Now, we've used this quite a bit with, um, with clients and, and producers here in Victoria because um, we've been through this phase that, that you find yourself in now where there is money available, um, which I'll talk about again in a bit. But it did see, unfortunately, people buy equipment that they actually just didn't necessarily need. So that's why we designed this in the, in the first place is to actually get people just to focus on what are we trying to achieve? What do we need to measure to help us achieve that? And therefore, what equipment is required? It also gets us to think about, do we need to own the equipment or can we get someone else to do it? So there are some things like being able to record pregnancy status, which we can do um, when the scanner is there. If your scanner is equipped with an EID reader, then they can record that information for you. So you don't need the equipment yourself in that instance. Uh, there are other things we can do, like we can actually record that birth status. So as Ash mentioned, you can, when your tags are printed and they've got the serial number on the outside, you can just keep track of that at landmarking to be able to say that I've got this mob that's coming in now and we've used tag one to 358 and they're all twin born lambs by a particular sire or they're just twin born lambs, merino to merino or whatever it is that you, you know want to identify that mob as. You can just write that down and then you can go back to the original file that came with the tags and you can actually match that up against their RFID number. So you can collect that piece of information without actually using an electronic reader at all. So it's a process that I, I would like everyone to go through is to actually set their objective and then work out from there what equipment they might need. Now let's get us into, do we actually even need equipment? So that's the first question. Am I gonna need equipment? And if I do, what might we actually want? Now, the one good bit of news um, is that when I first started working in this space, the readers that we had were genuinely no good. Um, they had no, they had really poor battery life. Um, they weren't terribly user friendly. So this has changed a lot in terms of handheld readers. So across the line here, just to give you a bit of context, from left to right, the one on the left is the Allflex. Um, it's just the little, it's the most basic of the readers push the button, it reads a tag, it links with Bluetooth to something else. So that could be to your scales. Um, if it was a, um, yeah, it could be your scales, it could be a computer, depending on if you're using software. The next one along, the orange one there is the, the Gallagher reader. Um, you might've seen those around. Anyone who's been involved with cattle, these are all the same readers that are used in cattle. It's all the same technology. Um, the middle one the, with the green is the Allflex reader. The blue handle one is the Shearwell reader. It's it's one of the more basic of the readers. Um, it has a small advantage in that it can just you run off normal AA batteries. So if you ever get caught with flat battery, you can literally just pop those batteries out and stick any AA batteries in them. Um, and the one on the far right is the True Test stick reader. All really good readers. Um, as I say, they've come so far from when I first started in this space where we were having to change batteries every hour or so. Um, these days you get 14, 15, 16 hours out of, 
out of them. So um, for instance, I've got a, a true test, the yellow one on the right hand side. Um, it doesn't get a lot of use. A lot of it's just for demonstrations and things, but it does give me the opportunity to um, to use it. Sorry, I'm not sure why that skipped then. Um, to, to use it and the battery basically really goes flat and I don't charge it very often at all. The panel readers along the bottom, the main thing to understand about panel readers um, is that they aren't designed to read sheep as they run past, they are designed to read sheep as they are stationary in front of them. So in a sale yard setting where there are going to be sheep running past, they use specialised readers that are specifically designed for that. Um, your normal panel reader isn't. Uh, and, and hopefully you'll be able to attend some workshops that show you how these readers work, how steel can interfere with them. There are some little tricks and, and tips for just getting them set up in a way that will work for you without any other interference. But they're great for mount, mounting on, on a weight crate or a handle or anything like that. Speaking of handlers uh, and, and moving on to Auto drafters. Auto drafters are a brilliant, brilliant piece of equipment that um, can allow you to use EID draft animals on essentially any trait you can possibly think of. Um, so we can run sheep at an auto drafter. If we've got it set up well, it can draft all the twin born animals off to one side. It could born, it could be drafting anything by a particular sire. Um, they are absolutely brilliant pieces of equipment. Uh, the one thing I would say is they're certainly not cheap and so for that reason you do want to make sure that they it is something you're absolutely going to use. The majority of our clients uh, would use them on the basis that they do a lot of weighing anyway and so it speeds up their weighing process. Um, all of the different um, brands are great, uh, they're so much better than the, the early auto drafters um, and yeah that, they're a brilliant piece of equipment. The next step up obviously is to go into something like a sheep handler, which allows you to combine multiple tasks at once. Um, they are large, they're expensive, but they do have the brilliant capacity to combine multiple tasks. So across all of the brands, again, I'm happy to talk specifics if we, when we get into the questions, um, but in terms of brands, they're all really reliable. They do a great job from the simple little immobiliser down on the bottom left, um, up into the Clipex or the, the Racewell um, or Tapari handlers. So the one thing about them, you've got to make sure they're actually going to fit in your yards, but they do allow you to combine multiple tasks while using EID, auto drafting at the same time and handling them. The one thing I would remind you is that dollar for dollar, which is what this grant system is, um, is not free money. So you've still got to put your own money in. So if you go and buy a piece of equipment like a handler and it costs you 30 $35,000, you've got to find a big swag of that $35,000. And there is the very real potential that you could have achieved all of that same um, gain out of the individual animal management out of simply buying a stick breeder. And a stick breeder might cost you $3,000, for instance, of which you're getting 50% of that paid for by the government, it means it's only actually cost you $1,500. So dollar for dollar isn't free. And this is the reason I put this warning in, and, I, and I've talked about it a bit, is we saw this in Victoria when there was grant money available, people went and bought things like auto drafters and then barely used them. So it was still their money. They still spent a lot, a decent whack of their own money going and buying equipment, even though the government was matching it. Um, and yeah, the equipment wasn't necessarily being used. That's why I always put this warning in that you also need to make sure that your data you're collecting is worthwhile because the collection of data is a complete waste of time and money unless you actually use it. I've heard it so many times here in Victoria, people have said, oh, you should see all the data I've collected. I've got these great spreadsheets. And I say to them, what are you gonna do with it? And they say, oh, I don't know, but it's gonna be good. We're not here just to collect data. We need to make sure that we're actually going to do something with it. And so that's why it's really important that you start with the why. Why are we looking to, to collect information in the first place? So my, my parting message is, have a plan, keep it simple. The equipment we've got available to us now is, is so much better than what we had 10 years ago. All of the brands are, are very reliable. The one thing I would say is, and people, so the, the questions that the sort of questions that we'll often get is, if I've got a, an all flex stick reader, will it talk to a true test, um, to a true, true test indicator and set of scales? It absolutely will. They all talk the same language. People will often ask if I've got shear well tags in my sheep, can I read them with an all flex reader? Absolutely. 
It's all exactly the same technology. So every brand talks to each other. The risk of having different brands is that if something goes wrong, um, you often have to talk to two companies and they might not necessarily agree with each other as to who's causing the problem. So um, keeping the same brand just keeps life a bit simpler for you. And sometimes the other part of that is just knowing who you've got in your area. If you've got one of the companies that has a really good um, rep in your area and a really good foothold, they do a great job of servicing other people, then that can be the difference in, in helping you decide which piece of equipment to go for, which brand of equipment to go for. Because having the help, and this is something I, I will say, is that you will need to be on the phone at some stage. The, the technology is not difficult, but it's also not simple. There are things that you are going to do and you might only do it once a year. And so working your way back through and remembering how to do it is not terribly easy at times. So you will end up on the phone. So sometimes just knowing who you've got to back up, who you can ring, who's going to give you that support is an important part of making that decision. So I think probably that's a good time to hand over and, and um, open it up for some questions. I'm happy to talk specifics on brands, different pieces of equipment, if anyone would like. Um, so I'll hand it back to you, Naomi, to handle the questions. Perfect. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, there isn't any questions so far, but if anyone listening has a question, just pop it into the questions or the chat box in your control panel. Okay, it's looking like that's about it, Nathan. Um, thanks for that. That was really comprehensive. If anyone does have any questions, feel free to still add them. I can send them on to Nathan or to Ash and they can get back to you via your email. Um, so thanks to everyone who's attended today. We hope it's we've been able to address your concerns or questions around Sheep EID. Uh, just a reminder, the handouts and a recording of today's webinar will be emailed out to those who registered in the next day or so. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks for attending.